Uh, so you have to think analytically about this. And, and this is really important because this is the actual issue is can texts derive new meaning that was not there in the past? And the answer to that is no. Okay. It has to be. There is no theor- there is no theoretical hermeneutical process where you can actually have a methodology where meaning can be imported back into a text that was not there. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and biblical languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. Welcome back to the Bible Sojourner. Today, we're going to be looking at hermeneutics. And hermeneutics simply is just how we read our Bibles. And we're going to look specifically at the issue of whether or not the New Testament should have priority over the Old Testament. Now, this has been an issue which has arisen quite frequently over the last few months on social media. I've seen it showing up periodically. And I think it's really important to discuss because it really kind of helps front the presuppositions and how you ought to think through reading the Bible. And as my buddy and colleague Doug Bookman would say, is there anything more important than how to read the revelation of God? We need to really make sure we understand what we're doing. And so we're going to be reviewing an article today, and it's going to help us have a conversation about this. And I have my own thoughts on this that we're going to talk about, but it often helps to analyze what other people have said. And so we're going to do a review article. And the article is entitled Hermeneutics New Testament Priority, written by a gentleman by the name of Tom Hicks. Now, Tom Hicks, if we move over to his biography here, he serves as the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana. He's married to Joy and they have four children, Sophie, Carly, Rebecca, and David. He has his MDiv and PhD from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He majored in church history with an emphasis on Baptist and systematic theology was his minor. Now, he is a part of founders.org. That's where this article is located. And I don't really know him from Adam. Honestly, I've seen him interact a little bit on social media. And one of the things that I think we need to just say out of the gate is that I'm not trying to attack him at all. In fact, from what I've seen, he and I would probably agree on a lot. Uh, Theologically, we would be on many of the same pathways and positions. Uh, We're both Baptist. We would both agree on many of the doctrines of grace issues. But one of the things that I think is really important to understand is that it's not ungodly or wrong to disagree with one another or have a conversation. And so my goal would be that even if he listened to this, he would enjoy it. And hopefully I would treat him respectfully. Again, I really want to emphasize that I don't think he's ungodly or there's a problem with this. I just want to encourage, and that's what I try to do on this podcast. I hope it shows, but I just want to have good conversations about these things and not just throw people under the bus. Like I have no problems saying that if Tom Hicks and I were in a church together I hope that I would be loyal to him if he's the pastor and just really support his work and ministry and also that we could be friends. I think that that would not be out of the question. But at the same time, I think we should talk about issues like this because this is a very important issue and I think that we need to have the conversation. So that's the goal today is we're going to be uh, going through this article and then I'm going to give you some of my thoughts along the way. So I think that's how we'll start. All right, let's jump right in. So hermeneutics, New Testament priority, Tom Hicks is arguing for this New Testament priority. So he says, one of the important aspects of biblical hermeneutics, the theory of biblical interpretation, is the principle of New Testament priority. At the beginning of the Middle Ages, Augustine of Hippo, 354 to 430, expressed New Testament priority with the phrase, the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. This is my comment here. Maybe you've heard that phrase before. But that's one of the more well-known phrases by Augustine. And so he, he leads with that. And then this is back to his statement here. Augustine meant that the Old Testament contains shadowy types and figures that are only clearly revealed in the New Testament. In other words, the New Testament re- explains the Old Testament. All right, just a, a break there for just a minute. We will get back to this argument. But if Augustine meant that, which there could be some debate about that. I don't think 
I think there's more flexibility to what he actually means there. But even if he did, that doesn't mean that that's how we should do it. I would dare say even Hicks would say Augustine was wrong on many key issues, such as infant baptism, for example. So he goes on and says, the Protestant reformers and Puritans also looked to the New Testament to govern their interpretation of, of old. An early confessional particular Baptist, Nehemiah Cox, agreed with the Reformed interpretive principle when he wrote, the best interpreter of the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit speaking to us in the New. Now, I want to take a break right there for just a minute, and I want to really emphasize the fact that I think I could agree with this introduction, and I think most people could. And so in one sense, it, it sets the table, but it does so in a way where it doesn't actually raise what the real issue is. Because when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament or alludes to the Old Testament, we would expect the New Testament to authoritatively interpret the Old Testament in a appropriate and helpful way. And everyone really should agree with that. But the question really goes deeper. It's not just related to New Testament quoting the Old Testament. That's definitely involved. But the question goes deeper into what kind of relationship does the New Testament have with the Old Testament. And really, it comes down to the idea of, well, and people have used different terminology for this all over the place. Does the New Testament reinterpret the Old Testament? Does the New Testament reimagine the Old Testament? Does the New Testament reconfigure? You use a lot of the rewords there, and people have used it all over the place. The, the real question is, it's not just the quotations of the New Testament quoting the Old Testament, but what's also involved in this question of New Testament priority is, does New Testament theology trump Old Testament theology? And if you're thinking to yourself, well, of course it does. Well, you, you might not understand the actual issue at, at stake here. And so that's, that's the real issue. And Hicks does get into it, but the introduction's a little, I, I think it could, could do a little bit better job of showing what the actual issue is, but that's okay. It's just a short blog post, and I know it's just introducing us to the issue at large, but that's really what we're going to be going for. Okay, now the article goes on. The interpretive principle of New Testament priority is derived from an examination of the scriptures themselves. As we read the Bible, we notice that earlier texts never explicitly interpret later texts. Earlier texts provide the interpretive context for later texts, but earlier texts never cite later texts and explain them directly. Now, my note there is that that's kind of obvious, and I think he's trying to make a point, I'm assuming here, I'm trying to think the best, best about how he's arguing this. I think he's trying to make a, a super obvious point as just tried to explain that the New Testament ought to be more valuable because it's the only one that quotes the Old Testament. But, but it really kind of is, in one sense, it's not really a, a good point at all because the, the point that we would make is that uh, the Apostle Paul never quotes and interprets John MacArthur. I mean, why would we ever say that? There's, so, there, there's such a chronological gap between them. We, we understand that. But that doesn't mean that just because John MacArthur comes later that he has more authority than the Apostle Paul. Right, So the point isn't just chronology, the point is actually authority and inscripturation and inspiration. And so when, when he's making this point that the earlier texts are quoted by the later texts, and therefore I'm assuming, again, he doesn't state this directly, but I, I think he's implying that that makes the later texts more valuable. Uh, and and if I'm misrepresenting him, I apologize. I just I'm just trying to understand why he would say that because it's such an obvious point. You can't have earlier texts quoting later texts by the very definition of the fact that they're earlier chronologically. And so as I'm trying to follow the argument here about why he's arguing for New Testament priority, I'm assuming he's he's talking about some sort of weight or value that is put on New Testament texts because of their chronological position being found later. But I don't think that that's that's the I don't think that's the best argument that ought to be given. And so we'll think more about we'll think more about that as we go. Okay. So as we go, uh, notice he continues on, and we'll pick up uh, right here. Moreover, the later portion of any book always makes 
always makes clear the earlier portion, okay? And he says, when you just begin a, to read a novel, for example, you're still learning the characters, the setting, the context, et cetera. But later on, as the story progresses, things that happen earlier in the book make more sense and take on new meaning. Mysteries are resolved. Earlier conversations between characters gain new significance as the novel unfolds. Later parts of the story have primary ex explanatory powers over the earlier parts. Okay, going back to one of the things that he says is that things that happen earlier in the book make more sense and take on new meaning. Now, this is uh, an important point here. And I, I really want to emphasize this because when, when he says that uh, it takes on new meaning, okay, what, what he's doing here, and I don't know if he's intentionally doing this, again, assuming the best here, I think he's just speaking at a, at a lay level for people who really want to understand the issue, but hermeneutical science, for lack of a better term, uh, has, has recognized distinction between meaning and significance or application. So to put it one way, when, when we in hermeneutics are talking about meaning, it's what does a text mean by what it says. So for example, this may be a terrible example, but uh, God is good. Okay, what does that text mean? Okay, it means that God is good. And uh, the application or significance of that phrase can change based on the situation, based on the application. We, we understand that. But the, the meaning itself doesn't change. For example, God is good can't suddenly be used to mean that God is a spirit, right? That would be a total uh, nonsense meaning derived from those words in that context, right? The meaning itself is locked and fixed, okay? And that's how communication takes place. Meaning is locked and fixed, and that's how we as human beings are communicating, and we are communicating the way that God designed language to communicate. So it's important to make a distinction between meaning and significance or meaning and application. And in hermeneutical writings, that's what scholars have done. Maybe that's the first time you've ever heard of that. And if so, that's fine. That's part of the reason why we have this podcast to, to help you know that. But when we're talking about these things, it is helpful to think categorically about the meaning of a text versus its significance or application. So, so and, and on another contemporary application, when, when we communicate with one another, we understand that intuitively. We say something and it has one meaning. Everyone, if the communication process is successful, we understand what that meaning is. And then there are a variety of applications or uh, a variety of significances that can be applied to that. But I think it's important to, to just recognize that when you're reading a book, for example, uh, like any, even a fiction story, you could, you could think about, uh, you know, reading a book and the meaning itself doesn't change uh, from, the old, from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. You may have misunderstood what happened at the beginning, but the meaning itself didn't change. Now, you may understand later, oh, the meaning was actually this. I had understood that incorrectly. That's what could happen, and that often happens in mystery books. In fact, sometimes the author will intentionally mislead you by giving you a perspective from a different individual. And so you buy into that perspective and then all of a sudden you say, oh, wait a second. Now that I have more details, I actually understand what the meaning was all along, but the meaning didn't change. Okay. So the idea that new meanings can come into a story is actually incorrect. That's not what happens. Uh, so you have to think analytically about this. And, and this is really important because this is the actual issue is can texts derive new meaning that was not there in the past? And the answer to that is no. Okay, it has to be. There is, no theor there is no theoretical hermeneutical process where you can actually have a methodology where meaning can be imported back into a text that was not there originally. Now, applications? Yeah, applications, you can get those in, in plenty. Uh, there, there's lots of those that can come. Significance, they can come. And scripture does that all the time. But I would argue that there's there's never, and this is the debate though, but that's why I think it's important to have these conversations, is I'm convinced we can't go to any passage and see clear evidence of a meaning changing over time for scripture. I do think that there is lots of significance, lots of application that's brought out, but I don't see any 
texts where meaning itself changes. And I don't see that happening in our everyday communication either. And I think that's part of the that's part of the standard that we need to think about is that are we going to say that the biblical communication is far different than how all human beings of all time have communicated? Because that's essentially what you will be left with if you're going to argue that meaning can change over time. But that only happens in the Bible. It doesn't happen through regular language. That seems, that seems faulty. And it, 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 we would hope, at least, that if you do have the option of saying, no, communication is normal, uh, just like we've always experienced it, we see that as well in the Bible, you would, you would think that standardized communication, normal communication would be the priority because God wants to be understood. So I think that that's an important process. All right, so then he, he goes on and say, mysteries are resolved. Earlier conversations between characters gain new significance. And there he uses the term. I don't know if it's just uh, he brings it in now or not. But again, I, I, I would draw an important parallel here saying that we need to be specific in how we talk about this. Yes, new significance can happen as a novel unfolds, but not new meaning. I don't think that that's a possibility. And and yeah, if somebody, actually, that'd be interesting. If if you do find an example where meaning does change in a story, uh, I'd love to see an example of that because that really would be quite novel in my mind. And I'd love to think through it and see if that actually is happening. So I think what's happening here is uh, as as he concludes this statement, he says, later parts of the story have primary explanatory power over the earlier parts. But that's not exactly what's happening, okay? He's, he's arguing that because the later parts in a story uh, are at the end, they have determining power over what happens earlier. But what's actually happening is that there's a more complete picture. It's not that there's a reinterpretation. Remember, that's that's our key phrase there. A lot of times, those are the words that people use is that there's a reimagination, there's a reconfiguration, there's a reinterpretation. But that's not what's happening is as we as we normally read communication, human communication, we are getting a collective experience of information, it, a progressive understanding, if you will, a progress of revelation. And in doing that, we see that there's a unity and a harmony that's that's being involved there. And so that's how we ought to think of this. It's not, it's not that the later parts explain or, or trump the earlier parts. It's that there's a harmony that's involved. And, and as we see that displaying, we have a better contextual understanding. The, the way I like to, to, okay, this is a crazy illustration. And I'm, I'm sorry if you are offended, but I want to talk about Harry Potter for just a second. All right. Because I think this is a good illustration. All right. So if it's not, you can just... Just hit the fast forward button if you do not like Harry Potter. But the the illustration that I wanted to give is, oh man, if you haven't read Harry Potter, maybe you will get a spoiler. Okay, whatever. It's been so long. The spoiler is that Snape, Severus Snape, ends up being a good guy. Okay, spoiler alert. But he is such a jerk throughout. Okay, now, is Snape a jerk throughout in the first few few books? Of course he is. You know, he's so mean to Harry Potter. And that meaning does not change, okay? The meaning of Severus Snape being a jerk does not change. He, he absolutely is, is a jerk to Harry, and the things that he does are real uh, suffrages, which, which you know Harry does not like. All that's true. What happens later, the significance of that changes when Harry realizes the motivation for Snape doing that was actually not out of hatred, but out of love. So the meaning didn't change. Uh, we we understood what was happening and what was being said, but now we can appreciate it in a different context. And so that's a difference where, or that's an example, I should say, where the end of the story doesn't reinterpret or doesn't change the meaning. It just helps you appreciate what you knew in a different light. And so it's one of those things where I think that that's exactly how we need to read scripture as well, is we find out things at the end of the story which help us appreciate and apply the things that happened earlier in the story in new ways, yes, but nothing changes as far as meaning. The meaning was was real, it's fixed, and as I have heard multiple of my colleagues say, which I think is such a great idea is and, and way of framing it, is that a, a text cannot mean what it has never meant in the past. 
Okay, so that's that's the idea of fixed meaning, and that's really it's tied to the idea of authorial intent. Which, um, if you've been a f- listener to the podcast or a viewer, you know I harp on that a lot. Is that meaning is tied and fixed to authorial intent, and whatever the author, the human author, in light of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the confluence of God's design, whatever he intended the meaning to be. That's what the Holy Spirit intended the meaning to be. They, they are one. They are worked in a fixed harmony. Okay, that's the, that's the presupposition. That's really the only way it could work. Otherwise, you can't have confidence in what Scripture means because if the human author can mean one thing and the divine author can mean something totally different, then you, know, you have hidden meaning, senses plenty or ideas, which uh, many people have written on just the travesty that that is. Uh, you could look at Vlock's books, Chow's book. You could look at uh, Kaiser's book. Um, all the all those guys, even even all millennialists like G.K. Beale have written uh, very persuasively, in my mind, against this idea of census plenior. And I think it's something we need to really be cognizant of. Okay, so then in the last paragraph, he says the hermeneutical principle of New Testament priority simply recognizes these facts. Well, now you know what my assessment of those facts are. Following the Bible's own example, interpreters should allow later revelation in the Bible to explain earlier revelation, rather than insisting on their own uninspired interpretations of earlier revelation without reference to the authoritative explanations of later revelation. Now, one of the things we need to understand here, and I, I really do think that this is this is key, is that it's not just a New Testament use of the Old Testament issue. Uh, because I could get behind that, and I would say, yes, when a New Testament text uses the Old Testament, however the New Testament uses it must be an appropriate use of that. But the New Testament doesn't always use the texts the same way. The New Testament can use it as an illustration. The New Testament can use it to, to point out significance. The New Testament isn't always saying, this is what the text meant it's often saying this is what the text signifies or this is what the text applies. This is how the text applies. And so we need to be aware of that. But what we also need to understand, and Hicks doesn't, doesn't really talk too much about this, um, and I, I, I know it's a blog article so you can't fit everything in there, but it's not just about how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. It's, it's about the prioritization of theology and systems. And so a lot of the New Testament authors are, or I should say, I should say it this way, a lot of uh, non-dispensationalists or usually covenant theologians, but anybody could be guilty of this, even dispensationalists, honestly. Uh, what we need to be careful of, of and, and try to shy away from methodologically is when we have a New Testament theology, which then we import to reading the Old Testament or perhaps we, we form a paradigm of New Testament theology, and then we place it on the Old Testament. That would be incorrect. But that is, in essence, what happens a lot of times. Now, to kind of show you that, I'm going to just depart for just a moment. I'm going to reference uh, this book by my buddy and colleague, Mike Vlock. So Dispensational Hermeneutics. We did a podcast reviewing this book, if you uh, look through the history. And uh, one of the things that he does is just kind of explain the different viewpoints hermeneutically of dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists. And one of the things that he does is talking about this issue of New Testament priority. And I think I've mentioned this before, but uh, it may have been on that podcast where I interviewed Vlock about his book, but the understanding that this is the battleground between different theological viewpoints is really helpful. New Testament priority really does become the battleground of covenant theology versus dispensationalism. I mean, there are other issues involved, to be sure, but no other issue really encapsulates the debate than this one. And uh, Vlock includes a few quotes by George Eldon Ladd, who's pretty famous. You've heard of him, no doubt. He's very influential on biblical interpretation. And I want to point out a couple different things that he says. We could actually include a lot more quotes, but I just want to uh, cite these because it was an easy reference for me to do so. And so Vlock points out uh, Ladd's comments on Acts 2, and, and Ladd says this, that Acts 2 involves a rather radical interpretation, a radical reinterpretation, excuse me, of the Old Testament prophecies, but no more so than the entire reinterpretation of God's redemptive plan by the early church. 
So notice there, and that's why I said a lot of times this has to do with the idea of reinterpretation. And scholars understand that, that at least today, Ladd wrote earlier on in life uh, in, the, in the 70s. And so earlier on, it doesn't seem that earlier, but yeah, in the 70s, 1970s. So, but he was very influential. But back then, people just said what they meant and it was no problem. And reinterpretation wasn't a dirty word. Well, now reinterpretation is a dirty word. So people come up with different ways uh, to talk about this. And, and I, I've heard lots of different phrases recently, reimagination, uh, reconfiguration, uh, fulfillment, all those are, are different ways of saying the same thing a lot of times. I mean, they're, they're making the same arguments. They're just using different descriptive terms. The point is that there's a New Testament idea behind this viewpoint that there's some change going on from the Old to the New Testament, and the New Testament therefore supersedes whatever's found in the Old Testament. Now, Ladd has a, has a better quote which gets to that point. He says this, here is the basic watershed between a dispensational and a non-dispensational theology. All right, this is George Eldon Ladd speaking, and this is in his historic premillennial uh, defense in the, in the book, The Meaning of the Millennium. He says, dispensationalism forms its eschatology by a literal interpretation of the Old Testament and then fits the New Testament into it. A non-dispensational eschatology forms its theology from the explicit teaching of the New Testament. Okay, so now notice what he's saying before I go on. He's saying that uh, non-dispensationalist viewpoints start in the New Testament, take what seems to be clearly portrayed in the New Testament, and then goes back and tries to make the Old Testament make sense. Okay, that's what he's saying. And so what he says here, he goes on. I think this is, this is helpful how he phrases this. It says, it, that is non-dispensational eschatology, it confesses that it cannot be sure how Old Testament prophecies of the end are to be fulfilled. For A, the first coming of Christ was accomplished in terms not foreseen by literal interpretation of the Old Testament, and B, there are unavoidable indications that the Old Testament promises to Israel are fulfilled in the Christian church. All right, end quote. You know what he's saying there? And he, he says, and I think this, is, this gets at the core of the issue, right? He says, it confesses, okay, this is what he says, it confesses that it cannot be sure how the Old Testament prophecies of the end are to be fulfilled. Now, no, now not everyone says it exactly the same way, right? But Ladd is a superstar in these kinds of discussions, okay? And what Ladd is saying, in essence, is that Based on our, our paradigm, how we're starting with the New Testament, we can't be sure exactly how the Old Testament works. We can't be sure exactly how it fits in, okay? And that's very candid of him. That's, that's appreciated, but it's unhelpful for us because we want to be sure how the Old Testament works. We do. We want to be able to go and read the Old Testament. Can you, with that kind of viewpoint, you, you know why people are scared of the Old Testament. You know why they don't derive as much benefit from it, right? Because you can't be sure exactly how the Old Testament is working since everything is being reconfigured, reimagined, reinterpreted, because it's it's a far departure from the authorial intent, right? And so this is this is the the other end of New Testament priority, right? It's not just saying that the New Testament gives clarity to the Old Testament. That would be a super oversimplification. That's not what's going on here. What's actually being said by this principle is that the New Testament theology is superimposed on the Old Testament so that even if the Old Testament speaks clearly on an issue, it doesn't matter because our understanding of the New Testament has to supersede what the Old Testament objectively says. That is the problem with New Testament priority. Okay, so now. We're going to talk more about the problems of New Testament priority at the, at the very end, but I guess here I'll just give one, one illustration of how that works sometimes, um, because I think we've all heard this one before, okay? And that's, that's who is the true Israel, okay? Who is the true Israel? We've seen this so many times, it probably won't even seem like a, like a New Testament use of the old or New Testament priority issue, but it actually is, because what happens is people will take passages like Romans 2 or Romans 9 or Philippians 3 
with the true circumcision, all those different things. There's lots of texts that could be interpreted subjectively as showing that the church has replaced Israel. Okay, So according to this viewpoint, the New Testament clearly teaches that the church has replaced Israel, right? And we also have the Old Testament very clearly and objectively saying that there's a future for geopolitical ethnic Israel as a nation. So how do we reconcile that? Well, we take what is our understanding of the New Testament, and then we put that paradigm over the Old Testament. That's often what happens, okay? Now, I'm just explaining what, what's happening, and I've gone into detail about how we, need to, how we need to think through those issues. And I've done whole podcast episodes. I did one recently where I critiqued Jeff Durbin's discussion of that and just showed how it's, it's hermeneutically irresponsible to take one text and then just put that as a paradigm over everything else. But that's essentially what this viewpoint of New Testament priority teaches, is that you take a canon within a canon. So yes, we believe that all of Scripture is God's inspired word, but really only the New Testament is extra inspired, right? It's only the New Testament is what really can speak authoritatively on these issues. And so we need to take that meaning and we need to put that over these other texts, which are a lot of times people say it's less clear because it's in the Old Testament. All right, now I want to go to what Hicks says about his response to MacArthur. Now, he picks MacArthur as a interlocutor, as a conversation partner, and I think that's, that's good. MacArthur's uh, well-known, has a lot of things written on things like this. And so this is his response to MacArthur's position. So he says, over against New Testament priority, John MacArthur claims that to make the New Testament the final authority on the Old Testament denies the perspicuity of the Old Testament as a perfect revelation in itself. And then he critiques it by saying, of course, MacArthur's claim is easily reversed. One might argue that to suggest that the New Testament is not the final authority on the Old Testament denies the perspicuity, which means clarity, of the New Testament as perfect revelation in itself. Now, I want to make a, uh, just a short note here that I'm not exactly sure how strong this argument is because I don't really understand the full implications of it. And maybe that says more about my inability. I am fully open to that. But I don't really understand what he's saying because it seems that he's saying that MacArthur is denying the clarity of the New Testament because MacArthur doesn't say that the New Testament can reinterpret the old. So in other words, because it's the final and fullest revelation, MacArthur should say that it is the clearest by definition. But that doesn't seem right. That, that doesn't seem consistent with, with my understanding of, of how Scripture works together. I mean, as, as I'll say later, I think the New Testament itself says that there are difficult texts within it. So in, in this case, uh, you have Hicks pointing to the fact that the Old Testament is called shadows and types, and there are some uh, passages which talk about prophecies being given in riddles. And that's true. Whether or not shadows and types mean that it's difficult to understand, I, I take that more as an example of patterns. In other words, it's just saying there are patterns that are given in the Old Testament that are looking forward to other things. I think that that doesn't really have anything to do with the difficulty of understanding. But let's just assume that there are difficult things to understand in the Old Testament, shall we? Well. The New Testament also says that there are difficult passages to understand. Uh, I mean, 2 Peter 3 is screaming at you, just saying uh, that there are things that Paul wrote that are hard to understand, and debased men twist those scriptures. So just because it's in the New Testament doesn't mean it's any easier to understand. I think that would be a, a misconstrual of what we ought to be thinking. So this, this is how I'd summarize this, this issue, is it's not necessarily you know, I don't think it's necessarily that the New Testament is easier to understand than the Old Testament or anything like that. I don't think that's even worth talking about because it's all inspired by God and there should be a clarity involved in God's revelation. We, I think we should understand that. Everyone who has a basic bibliology would affirm that, I think. But the point I think that we should make is that the New Testament actually assumes knowledge of the Old Testament and not vice versa. So example, when you're reading the Old Testament, it doesn't assume that you know the New Testament. But when you're reading the New Testament, it assumes you know the Old Testament. So 
this is what we call when this is what we call progressive revelation. This is what we are looking at when we when we think through. Okay, there's a progress of revelation. God's inspired text has been revealed in a progress, not just in a data dump. And so we need to go through chronological revelation, and and then we have we're following God's divine breadcrumbs, as it were, and we'll have the right kind of understanding as we go through that. And so I think that that's how we ought to ought to think through that. Now he goes down. Uh, and I'm just going to skip a little bit to his discussion of dispensationalism and paedobaptism because I think this can be more helpful. So he says, to illustrate how this principle of New Testament priority affects our theology, consider the example of dispensationalists and paedobaptists. Both dispensationalists and paedobaptists wrongly allow the Old Testament to have priority over the New Testament. Now, I would take issue of that, obviously. But one of the things that I would take issue with is that I'm not, I'm not saying the Old Testament has priority over the New Testament. And I don't think any dispensationalist would say that. At least if you're, they're thinking about it, I don't think they would say that. But what we would say is not that the Old Testament has priority, but that the Old Testament and New Testament are in harmony. That's what we would say. And that each text has a meaning fixed within it that can't be re, redone, it can't be reinterpreted or remade. That each text has a meaning, and then once we figure out what the meaning of that text is, then we can look at the meaning of other texts, and then we can put them all together in perfect harmony without changing the meaning of any of them. That's what a dispensationalist would say. Instead of saying, oh, the New Testament needs to have interpretive priority over the Old Testament, or the Old Testament needs to have interpretive priority over the New Testament. Both of those are theologically uh, problematic if you're trying to create a, a, a appropriate theology, recognizing that God has inspired both Old and New Testaments. All right, so now he gives the example of Genesis 17. Uh, He says, dispensationalists think Genesis 17.7 establishes an everlasting promise to national Israel. So Genesis 17.7 says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. So dispensationalists think Genesis 17.7 establishes an everlasting promise to national Israel, and they read their interpretation into the New Testament convinced that God has a future plan for national Israel. Okay, so let's, if we just looked at the context of Genesis 17, we are not convinced, we're not just convinced that the New Testament will harmonize with the Old Testament, that is is a presupposition of mine and presupposition of most dispensationalists, is that there will be a harmonization, but that we're also convinced that the New Testament is not going to contradict that. Okay, there's there's two aspects here. We believe in the same God. So why would there be, you know, it's it's funny, a lot of times dispensationalists get smacked around saying, oh, you believe that that God changes his plan over time or whatever. It's like, no, there's actually, uh, and in fact, (laughs) I loved you know, a lot of times Mike Vlock, he's just such a treasure. I really like him. Uh, and he's a, he's a dear friend and colleague. One of the things he, he, he made, you know, evident one time, I think he was getting sick of everyone always calling dispensationalism a system of discontinuity. He pointed out that dispensationalism is really the system of most continuity because we're saying things don't change, that there's, that there's a promise that God makes to his people and he's going to fulfill that. And so things like the land promise or the covenant with, with Israel continues. And really the only way out of that is to try to find some sort of system. Now, some people default to the system of New Testament priority and they say, well, listen, New Testament interprets uh, is Israel as the church, so therefore the promises can't be to national Israel. They have to be fulfilled in the church somehow, etc. And so I think that that's, that's one way people do it, but I don't think that that's a very good way, as I've been trying to point out. All right, now he says, um, Pato Baptists, on the other hand, think the promise in Genesis 17.7 is the covenant of grace with Abraham and all his physical children, which leads to the baptism of infants in the New Testament and to churches intentionally mixed with believers and unbelievers. Well, I would have to disagree with Hicks again. Now, Hicks is a covenant theologian, and so he has his, his understanding of the covenant of grace. My whole, my whole thought, and I wrote a whole book on this if you're interested, but my whole thought uh, is not that Pado baptists 
uh, wrongly put the Old Testament onto the New Testament. It's that they start with the understanding that there is such a thing as covenant theology. And I reject covenant theology. I don't think there is such a thing as a covenant of grace. I don't think there is such a thing as a covenant of works. And I know there are some of you who listen to this that say, wait a second, I do hold to those things. And I get that. And hopefully we can still be friends, right? Uh, in fact, hopefully we can have great conversations. I do plan on doing some episodes on, on those in, in the future. But my whole process as I'm working through the methodologies, there's nothing in scripture that talks about the, those systematic covenants. They're not biblical covenants. They're systematic covenants. And so when somebody is convinced of covenant theology, for example, as a, as a starting point, they put that on scripture and they say, well, like the Paedo-Baptist, Paedo-Baptist says, this is the covenant of grace. The Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of grace and the new covenant is the covenant of grace. Therefore, they must be the same. It has nothing to do with putting the Old Testament onto the New Testament. It has to do with reading scripture through a systematic lens instead of taking the meaning of scripture from that passage itself. Okay, so again, I go back, the default of what I'm advocating for is that in order to make a system, or in order to make a systematic theology, we need to interpret each and every text in its own context. The meaning is derived from that text, and then we are going to be able to uh, harmonize them together and formulate a systematic theology. All right, then he goes on and says, if, however, we allow the New Testament to interpret Genesis 17.7, then we will avoid the error committed by dispensationalism and paedobaptism. Galatians 3.16 says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. Note well that Galatians 3.16 explicitly denies a plural offspring. The promise is to one offspring only, not to many. Okay, so now what he's saying um, and this is what he's doing, you know, unapologetically in full detail. I appreciate the clarity that Hicks writes with on this. Is he's saying Galatians 3:16 says that the offspring that is mentioned only refers to Christ. Now, if you've listened to this podcast again, like at, at, for any amount of time, you know this is the easiest thing in the world to debunk. You can just go through Scripture and and you know show that that yes, there was an individual that was in fact. Here, Paul is referring to Genesis 22, where I would say the, the Hebrew actually makes a distinction between the plurality as well as the singularity of the offspring promise. In fact, Genesis 22 is so messianic, it just, just shouts at you with great volume because you have in Genesis 22, uh, where you have the, the offering of Isaac uh, by Abraham, or the uh, he doesn't actually offer him, you know what I'm saying, but he brings him to offer offer Isaac. But what ends up happening is that he gets spared. And as part of that, God comes to him and says, because you've not withheld your only son, I will make your descendants as the stars of the, of the sky and as the sand of the sea. So he's talking about plurality there, but then he switches pronouns in Hebrew. And he says, and I will give your offspring the gate of his, singular, his enemies. And so he makes a distinction there. And so um, as I've become convinced of, in Hebrew, you actually have uh, a distinction being made between plural and singular offspring. And in Galatians 3, Paul seems to be picking up on that, interpreting the scriptures correctly in light of their context and saying, yes, there is a singular individual, the Messiah, the Christ, through whom all these blessings are going to go. But that doesn't negate the fact that the Abrahamic covenant also involves application to a plurality of descendants, which was actually found in that same very passage of Genesis 22. And so it's it's one of those things where, and, and I've done other podcasts about, and Mike Vlock has done great stuff on this as well, where the seed of Abraham has multiple meanings throughout scripture. Uh, you know, you have the singular descendant, which is Christ, but you also have the the unbelieving Israelite, you also have the believing Israelite, and you also have the Gentiles who, who like Abraham, exercise faith in the Messiah. So you have at least four different references to who can rightly be called the offspring of Abraham or the seed. And so it, it's just, I don't know, it seems obvious to me when I look through scripture, all you have to do is just look at all the context and start tabulating. In fact, I would encourage anybody who really doubts that, just run a word search on this and just run through all the different occurrences and you'll come up with those categories. But the issue here is that you have 
you have somebody like Hicks or multiple other people who use this from the covenant theology background is they'll say, well, look, we have a clear meaning in Galatians 3.16. Now let's take that and just throw that over every other occurrence in the Bible. Okay, are we really okay with that methodology? That, I mean, we shouldn't be. We, we don't do that with any other, well, okay, I was going to say we don't do that with anything else, but there are a lot of false teachings that, that utilize that same kind of idea. It's called proof texting. It's proof texting, and everybody in hermeneutics knows, oh, got to avoid proof texting. But then here we do it, and we say, well, look, this is, this is how we do it. And, and we just really need to be cautious of this. We can't just take one meaning of Scripture and just import it across the canon saying this is what every text that includes this word means. That is insane. To give, to give a very modern example, um, let's, let's just take one of the most famous examples that's used in linguistics, the word bank, right? So the word bank, it can have multiple meanings depending on the context. And let's say I, I tell you as, as an avid listener, and I'm going to bank on your support. I'm going to bank on your support because I really appreciate you. I'm, I'm banking on your support. And so you say, okay, great. So I now know that anytime I hear the word bank, that that's what it means, that it means some sort of support or reliance on something. So are you going to go to the bank? Are you going to uh, be banking the basketball later today off the backboard. You know, the, the point is that you can't just take one context from a situation and then just say that's the only kind of meaning that this can have. That's obviously ridiculous. Everybody knows it, but sometimes we just forget to call it out the way it is. And so again, and, I, and this isn't unique with Hicks. I appreciate how he's arguing cogently about this. And he's, he's arguing very historically and that's one of the things that particular Baptists are often known for, and I appreciate that, is, is just good representation of the historical argumentation. My pushback on that is just that, that that is a wrong methodology to take one meaning of a text, which I agree with the interpretation of Galatians 3, quoting Genesis 22. I absolutely agree with that. But I just am saying you can't then take that and take your understanding of New Testament theology and just run roughshod over all the other texts in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, which refer to this concept. So it's just really, really important. And so notice even how his next paragraph says, therefore, in light of the clear teaching of the New Testament, we must conclude that both dispensationalists and paedobaptists misinterpret the Old Testament because they fail to allow the New Testament to have priority of interpretation. Well, that's a little circular because what he's saying is that we conclude that they're doing it wrongly because they're not using New Testament. And how do we know that that we should use New Testament priority? My pushback is that we New Testament priority is is a faulty methodology. We definitely want to avoid that. And so I think, yeah, look looking at that, I would say we can actually even have the same interpretation of a New Testament passage as in this case. But then there's a subjective component to this where Hicks and others are saying, then we must import this, this meaning across the board through Old and New Testament in every other passage. And, and that's why the difference, the alternative to New Testament priority is what I, what I think we should call passage priority, meaning that the meaning of every text is found in that text. And you don't have to go outside the text to have uh, some sort of paradigm that's put back on the text. But that's not in vogue today, but I think that that's how we need to think through that. All right, so hopefully that's helpful to go through what Hicks says and and kind of help paint a contrast for that. But to kind of conclude the episode today, I want to I wanna draw maybe three major problems with this viewpoint of New Testament priority to kind of summarize our thoughts on this. And I think... N- We've been talking about these things throughout as I've been responding, but just to really summarize them, maybe this will be this will be helpful. So three major problems of New Testament priority. On the one hand, and I think this is really important, is that New Testament priority creates a canon within a canon. Okay, it it makes a standard by which we evaluate everything. So th- there is a surface level claim that all of scripture is inspired by God and it's equally inspired by God and it's equally helpful. And yet there is a 
canon within the canon where the New Testament becomes the priority for evaluating the Old Testament theology. For example, the what what Hicks pointed out with believing a future for national Israel, well, because somebody has interpreted the New Testament to say that there is no future for national Israel, now we need to use that canon within a canon to get rid of the clear Old Testament teachings of a future for national Israel, for example. Now, one of the things I often point out as just a test case for one's eschatology is that it, your eschatology should be the same at the end of the Old Testament as it is at the end of the New Testament. So in other words, if you never had the New Testament, I know this sounds heretical to people, but just go with it for a second. If you had only the Old Testament, could you get your theology? Would you be able to you know, fully form your theology? And that's one thing that I'm so excited about being a premillennialist. It's like, yeah, of course, you know, premillennialism is obviously in the Old Testament. In fact, that is the default. In fact, some covenantal interpreters have have made that claim is that if it wasn't for the New Testament, you would have to be premillennial. And so I know people will disagree with me on that. It's fine. We can disagree in brotherly love and you can tear me up and down. It's fine. But my point is that you need to have a consistency that's my presupposition, at least. You can argue and say it doesn't have to be a consistency, but I think there are huge methodological problems with that. So you have a canon within a canon if you're saying that the New Testament has to have priority. And I would actually say, if this is just me talking to you, you can listen to this and think it's wise or you can think it's completely foolish. But I think that this is part of the reason why there's a rise in the interest of theonomy today. It's because people are sick of the fact of people saying the Old Testament doesn't matter or the Old Testament can't can't stand on its own. And it is kind of interesting. It's uh, you know, theonomy in in many ways is birthed out of covenant theology, but it's really kind of the reason it it never took off um, until recently with the advent of social media and all that was was really because there's some glaring inconsistencies with it usually within the theological camps, because a lot of the theonomists would actually hold to New Testament priority, at least as far as a system, uh, in relegating the church as Israel and all those things. But then with Old Testament law, they argue the exact opposite, saying unless the New Testament explicitly changes something, we need to make sure that we keep it the same. And so there is a, there's a bit of an inconsistency there at times. But I would say that I think that one of the one of the reasons theonomy has been so attractive to people is because the theonomist can just say, "Listen, we should just take the Old Testament as it stands. Why would we? Why would we ignore the Old Testament? It's God's revelation, just like the New Testament." And that appeals to people because I think they they know that there's a incongruity there if we just say the New Testament is our is our driving authority. And so I think, yeah, there's there's a problem with. The whole New Testament priority, it causes some friction there that has resulted in some interesting phenomenon. So uh, number two, uh, New Testament priority operates on the faulty assumption that everything in the New Testament is more clear than the Old Testament. Okay, so again, Hicks's, ar- Hicks's article was filled with this, with this assumption, and almost everybody who ever writes on this assumes that that the clear passages need to interpret the less clear passages, and the more clear passages are always the New Testament. They're always the New Testament. And it's interesting because the Old Testament is very clear on issues, very clear. And the only reason the, the Old Testament loses its clarity is because of someone's interpretation of the New Testament. And again, that, that may be a problem. Uh, in fact, I think it's important, and I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's important to to put out the reminder that Peter made a claim that the clarity of Paul's writings were in question. Uh, let me bring that up here. And uh, in Second Peter three fifteen and sixteen, he says, "And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved pa- brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand." which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So notice what Peter's saying is he's saying, listen, I understand that Paul is hard to understand. I know that Paul, some of the things that Paul writes are difficult. Uh, 
put that in contrast, actually, this is kind of an interesting thought thought process, is how many times does Jesus actually say you should have understood the Old Testament? I think that's fascinating. In fact, in Luke 24, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, notice they're not slow to necessarily understand. He's saying you're slow to believe it. You understood what the prophets were saying. It was very clear in the Old Testament, and yet you, you were slow to believe it. And it's, it's really kind of interesting. Now, I, I could be a jerk here um, and say, well, look, based on this, it's saying that the Old Testament is more clear than the New Testament. Because if you, and this is the problem with proof texting, right? You could literally mean whatever you want. And so I'm just using this as a silly illustration. But based on what Peter says, I could argue that the Old Testament prophets were more clear than Paul. Because Peter says that Paul was difficult to understand in some places. And Jesus says that you ought to have under, you, ought, you ought to have believed what you understood the prophets to be saying, right? So, and I'm, I'm not saying that because, again, I'm trying to be consistent. And I'm saying it's just silly to argue that we can proof text all over and take one meaning and apply it to other places in Scripture. That's just not how you do interpretation. Remember, what you need to do is each text, the meaning of that text is found within that text. And then you can apply that theology that you're deriving in a variety of ways. Uh, so, so you can't just take the meaning of certain texts and apply it over other texts. I need to say that a million times just because I think hopefully you, you get the consistency that I'm trying to bring to bear on that. It's really the inconsistency that drives a lot of these issues up. But the point is, the, the simple point, which hopefully is, is helpful, is understanding that the New Testament, just because it's more recent, doesn't mean it is more clear. Okay, there, there is, there is an assumption a lot of times that 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 is true, but not everything in the New Testament is more clear than the Old Testament. And if our assumption is that God has revealed Himself with clarity, like He He reveals Himself in order to be known, so He's not He's not delighting in in saying ha. I, they, they sure missed this because I did it in just a murky enough way where everyone's going to get that one wrong. I mean, some of the statements that we argue about, uh, in reinterpreting them are just so clear. It's like, yeah, Israel will be united again. Israel and Judah will be brought back to Jerusalem and, and the, the Messiah will reign in Jerusalem over them. You're just like, that's really clear. Uh, there was no question about what that meant until we decided, oh, this is difficult because Israel's not in Jerusalem, and what are we going to do with that? And then, so we come up with our own ways of interpreting those things. So it is, I think, really important to to think through these issues. So last thing, last, uh, and there are probably others, but I just wanted to put a few of these. So an, another major problem with New Testament priority is that New Testament priority it often is a guise of subjective interpretation, and it elevates that subjective interpretation as the key to unlocking Old Testament texts. I know people don't want to hear this, but I have to say it because this is often what happens. Because when someone says we need to hold to New Testament priority, really what they're saying is we need to hold to my understanding of New Testament theology as the key to unlocking Old Testament. That's really what they're saying. Because, listen, I could actually say, yeah, I hold to New Testament, uh, New Testament priority because my, my view of New Testament passages is that it harmonizes completely with the Old Testament. That's the point. You know, all these, you know, a lot of people, especially covenant theologians, who, who have this methodology of taking New Testament theology and looking back to the Old Testament, one of the interesting phenomenon with that is that I often disagree with them on how the New Testament text is interpreted. Why is that? Why is it that I often, now it's not always the case, but I often disagree with how they actually are interpreting New Testament theology? It's because of our presuppositions. They have a subjective understanding of New Testament and saying that is the key to unlocking the Old Testament, whereas I'm actually fine with taking my New Testament theology and going back to the Old Testament, but it's because they've been harmonized. Because I, and I'm not, it's not even that big of an effort. Um, what I mean by that when I say they've been harmonized is I mean that I've gone through the text of the Old Testament to determine the meaning, and I've gone through the New Testament 
with an understanding that the Old Testament already has a meaning and is the New Testament consistent with that? And there's not been an, there's not been a situation that I have found. And I'm open to discuss more of these passages. I'm I'm open to look at them. I haven't looked at all of them. I'm sure as much detail as I need to, but I've not found a passage in the New Testament where it's just it's impossible that the New Testament, uh, it's impossible that the Old Testament is being used in line with its with its literal authorial intent that the Old Testament author uh, wrote with. I haven't found one of those. Uh, and so that's that's one of the big differences, the presuppositions, is that usually when somebody says, well, New Testament needs to have priority, in essence, what they're really saying is that my understanding of the New Testament needs to take priority. But I would just gently push back saying, listen, the New Testament actually fits very well with Old Testament theology. And that that's an important concession. It's important understanding. Uh, lots of people have pointed this out, and I, I just think it's it's important not to not to say Old Testament has priority, not to say New Testament has priority, but to say let's look at the text in context. Let's let's look at meaning. What and what is meaning? It's what the author intended within his circumstance, in his setting, in his clear writing. Let's look at what the author intended to mean, and that is confluence, confluence with the divine meaning of the author. God, those were, are working in tandem. And if we do that, then there's going to be a harmony between Old and New Testaments. That's, that's the assumption. And it's not, it's not going to require any reimagining. It's not going to re- require any reconfiguring because it's one unified plan of God. It's one unified plan that doesn't change. God gives, gives a clear understanding and, and he sticks with that. Now, listen, I know we've covered a lot of ground on this. And I know that some people are going to be upset. They're saying, I, I, don't, I don't use subjective interpretation. I know that. I get that. I know that that's going to be the pushback from, from different covenant theologians. And if Hicks ever, I, I'm not, different people do this to different degrees, right? And I'm not saying that Hicks is the arch enemy of doing this. But what I'm saying is that the, the pattern or the methodology of New Testament interpreting the Old Testament is a subjective standard. Because you actually, there is, there is no standard to evaluate how you know if you've got it right. Because, you know, I could say, now people are going to hate this, but I could say that, oh, the New Testament clearly teaches that only women can be saved. And therefore, since God promises that Israel uh, will be saved, then therefore Israel must be a reference to women. I could argue that, right? All it takes is just my understanding of the New Testament text. I just need something. The point is, I know you guys hate me, right? But my, my simple point is that we need an objective standard, and that objective standard has to be authorial intent. And if you go by authorial intent, you cannot go by New Testament reinterpretation of the old or New Testament priority over the old. It's just not congruent with that. So that's, that's my assessment of the issue. Maybe you found it helpful, maybe you haven't. But regardless, I always enjoy hearing from you. If you want to drop me a comment or you want to reach out on my website, I love to hear from you. I do realize that many of you who have emailed me, I've not gotten back to, but I just really do appreciate every everybody who's reached out and I will try to get back to you either maybe do a special podcast episode where I can go through some of those emails or get back to you at some point. But I do appreciate the support, the encouragement, the challenges on different issues. I really appreciate those things. So hopefully this is helpful. If you want more information about me, you can visit petergaming.com. If you want more information about Shepherd's Theological Seminary, you can visit shepherds.edu. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.